developers spend a lot of time in our terminals. Or we could spend even more, because there are so many great CLI and UI tools available out there that can boost our productivity or just be fun to use. Since this channel is mostly about Go, I will start with tools related to Go specifically. Obviously, we should have the Go itself installed, ideally the latest version. And here, actually, I don't use any runtime version managers similar to NVM or ASDF, because Go keeps its promise of being a backward compatible language. So it's quite easy to compile a program that was written five years ago, and most of the cases you won't have any issues. So we are on the latest version of Go, I believe. We all love when our code is well formatted, statically checked. And I'm so happy there are no such things as ESLint or Pretier in Go. Go comes with Go format or Go FMT command. Nevertheless, it's not only Go format. There are other alternatives, and I started using something like GoFumpt. I'm not sure how to pronounce it correctly, but it's a bit stricter version of Go format. What's cool is that it's a drop in replacement for Go format. So I have it already installed in my NeoVim setup. So let's say we have a kind of DB proxy address, and I'll format the file. And I can see that a bit stricter format has been applied. So, for example, constants have been grouped in this block. Um, there was a space added here, imports probably sorted using go imports or something else. Yeah, probably just a little bit cleaner version of what we had before. You can install it as a binary or also integrate in your editor. I use NeoVim and there is Mason there that installs it for me. There are a few other formatters, but I won't dive into them. There are actually not that many. On the other hand, there are many, many linters Go has. There is a famous GoVet, static check, unused and many, many more, as we can see in this list. And this runner is really, really great. It's called Golang CI Lint that can execute all of these linters for you. You can configure them, uh, execute them in GitHub Actions, in your CI, locally. So super powerful tool. So let's execute it on, on one of our projects. So do Golang CI lint run. And we immediately see this really, really helpful error that return value or error return value of uh, dst.write is not checked. So because probably if you open the right manual file 78, so we actually call this dst.write function that returns an error and didn't check uh, the error value, which in Go is a bad practice generally. You can configure what linters to run. You can use the default configuration um, or just run all of the linters, though it will probably take some time. And in terms of Go specific command line tools and TUIs, that's probably it. Obviously, each project requires its own set of tools. So, for example, if you want to generate open API schema, you'll, you'll need some generator that works with Go or protobuf generators. And that's also maybe because Go comes with very robust and verbose toolchain. So you don't need anything external to, let's say, run your tests or benchmarks or do some basic profiling and debugging. Now let's jump into the world of nice-looking terminal UIs or TUIs. I work a lot with containers daily, so it's important for me to have my own set of tools that keep me productive. And as a container runtime, I've been using Docker Desktop for a while, uh, pretty much since Docker came out. Only recently, it started kind of crashing a lot, and generally we know that Docker Desktop is not free for everyone. So I've been kind of exploring some alternatives. I tried Podman for a while, it didn't click with me, and then I found a tool that works really well for me. It's called Colima. It's a minimalistic container runtime, it works on macOS and Linux, has kind of this imperative uh, CLI, and uh, super easy to use, doesn't take too many resources. You can run Kubernetes with that, uh, supports different runtimes. And so it becomes really easy to manage my runtime. So I use Colima start. I can, let's say, enable Kubernetes and maybe edit also some configurations. And so when we provide this dash dash edit option, you will enter this configuration file, which is in YAML, and you can set your, let's say, CPU, memory limits, Kubernetes settings, uh, network settings, and so on, right? And then just maybe edit something here and then save it. And so my container runtime is ready now. I enabled it with Kubernetes, so to use K3S for that. Um, it created the context Colima and set it as default. Uh, yeah, and that's it. Now I can use docker run commands, docker compose commands as just in normal docker desktop environment, right? So for example, in this project, there is a docker compose file, so I can just, just do maybe docker compose up minus d, let's say, right? Uh, right, there's a MySQL that we need to pull. 
Now, Colima is just a runtime. It doesn't come with any UI or even terminal UI to kind of browse your containers. And obviously, you can use Docker PS or Docker Compose PS to list your running containers. But there is another great tool that I want to recommend, and it's called Lazy Docker. So it's a really cool looking terminal UI that lets you list your running containers and explore volumes and do different actions on them. You will see all your containers running here, all volumes and images created. And yeah, you can navigate to, let's say, running container, press shift question mark, and then, yeah, kind of have this helper menu of what to do with that, like, you know, stop, exit, maybe uh, browse the logs, etc. Um, right, so you can go to images, uh, volumes, networks, and so on. So quite handy GUI tool that I use daily. You can find Lazy Docker on the GitHub, obviously. Uh, see how to install it for your package manager, and yeah, see basically how to work with that. Now let's imagine you want to analyze your Docker images. Let's say you figure out why the size is so big, and we all know that Docker images consist of layers, and there is one really great tool uh, to help us with that. It's called Dive. So let's go to a project where we have a little bit bigger image, and build it first. So it took some time, but I built a GitHub runner for GPU. Obviously, this image is a little bit bigger because it has CUDA drivers and so forth. But now let's explore it with our dive command. So you can do dive GitHub runner. Cool. And now we are in this mod where we can see all the layers and can see the contents of these layers, right? So we can go kind of and see the changes. We can see the total image size, which is yeah quite big in this case. So probably makes sense to you know explore what happens here. And so you can see if we jump between one and two, you can see what has been changed. We can switch to this view and you know expand them. And so this tool is really helpful when you want to explore your Docker images, see what's inside of these layers and maybe then refactor them a bit. And another small tool I wanted to show you is the tool called CTOP that helps you monitor your resource utilization from your containers. So let's go back to our DB proxy. Actually, we don't need that at all, but when we hit, hit CTOP, we can see all of our containers running and we can see how much memory uh, they take, uh, network and CPU, right? So quite handy because the top command won't work in our case. You need to work in containers. So yeah, that's kind of, you can have a single view, log view as well here. So quite handy, small tool. I also work with Kubernetes quite often. And since we're running our small K3S cluster here, let's show a few commands that I use for Kubernetes as well. We all know that it's sometimes not easy to work with multiple clusters or namespaces and kubectl command um, can become you know, quite verbose and lengthy when you want to explore your resources. And there's one really great tool. It's called K9S and it gives you a really, really cool browser and switcher for your Kubernetes resources, right? So everything from pods to deployments to secrets, stateful sets. So everything that you have in Kubernetes, you can see in K9S, or almost everything. And so my cluster is ready, but there are no deployments there. So let's quickly install, let's say, Elasticsearch using Helm in our cluster. So you can do Helm repo at Elastic URL, and then install the name of the release, and then the Helm chart. So let's do that. Cool, and now we can open K9S and explore everything that we have. You can see we can switch between namespaces quite easily, so you can just hit zero for all, one for default, and there'll be more namespaces if you have here. Yeah, and you can do colon, for example, secret, and see all the secrets. You can uh, hit X kind of to see the certificates. So these are my locals, so uh, don't try to copy them anyway, they won't work for you. Um, yeah, we can see deployments. Uh, I believe that's that, and maybe we don't have any. Um, what else? Uh, let's say pods, right? Uh, we can see the pods running. We can go and see, again, this shift question mark, and we can see the logs. Let's say click L. So here we can see the logs, right? Go back, switch between namespaces as well. Um, right, so quite handy tool, super easy. I always keep it running when I work with Kubernetes cluster and just switch through that. 
However, when you don't need a terminal UI in front of you and still want to work with kubectl uh, imperative commands, you can use something like kubectx, and it also comes with kubeNS for easy context or I mean Kubernetes context and Kubernetes namespace uh, switcher. So right again, I can do just kubectx, and yeah, there will be this uh, fuzzy finder to switch context. So I have only Colima and then kubeNS to yeah, basically switch between namespaces, right? And so this thing that you can see here is called a uh, fuzzy finder, called command line fuzzy finder, FZF, uh, that you can also ex install separately. And I use it in many places. I use it in my uh, terminal in NeoVim, and it's used here as well, right? You can just type FZF and yeah, browse your files, right? You can also do FZF, um, I believe it's preview, and let's say some command like cat, and preview your files so quite handy right don't need to go to i don't know your editor and just browse files from here and so yeah you can find this tool on the github install it separately and yeah use it in your terminal for example i also use it for history suggestions so when i hit ctrl r i can see the commands i ran before and can yeah, basically quickly repeat them right so since we slightly shifted from go to containers to kubernetes to some fuzzy finders let me show you some tools in this area, kind of in the terminal uh, file processing that I find helpful as well. And one of them is this dead simple cat replacement tool. So if you can do cat main.go, right? Um, all right, I already have alias for me, but I hope you imagine cat would be just uh, white text on the black screen. While bat has syntax highlighting, has obviously line numbers, uh, git integrations, and so forth. So just yeah, just better cat, right? Uh, that's why I think it's called bat. Um, yeah, it's a super handy tool. It can also show you unprintable characters. So if you do minus uh, capital A, so you'll see kind of new lines and tabs in terms of Go. Now we are all aware of the GNU tool called grep, right? Quite popular. So let's say we want to find something recursively in the files. So we do that. And recently I started enjoying this tool called ribgrep or RG. It comes with really nice defaults, so it kind of respects your git ignore files and so forth, and it's generally quite fast. So we can do something similar to, to what we did with grep. So um, right, it's actually my SQL, right? It has lines as well here, much faster. I know that some NeoVim plugins use it as well. Obviously, you still should learn how to work with grep because you may not have rib grep on your server, and so knowing GNU grep is still useful these days. So when it comes to searching files in huge directories, we all probably used the find command, though it can become quite lengthy to write it and uh, maybe not so user-friendly, so fd is a great option as well here. So let's say if I go back and I want to find some um, go files, right? So I would do find maybe dot, maybe minus i name if it's a wildcard and something like, like that, right? So you'll find all the go files. Well, with fd, you can just simply type fd.go, right? So you have some, I don't think it's highlighting or maybe some form, so but just like a little bit more user-friendly and fast as well. Now let's talk a little bit about Git. There are so many graphical interfaces and command line tools and TUIs to work with that. But I personally use just standard git commands, uh, also with all my ZSH plugins, so I type a little bit less characters, so instead of git fetch I would just do gf, right? However, when I want to explore the history of a large git project, uh, there's this really great tool called LazyGit, also from the creator of LazyDocker. Uh, just uh, forgot the last name, I'll put the link, you will see. Uh, LazyGit, right, so change the files, that's what we did with um, go formatting. Um, yeah, let's go to commits, for example, and see the logs, right? So super helpful, really cool tool. Um, you can, yeah, do er everything from here. Uh, rebase, commit, do your branch switching, etc. Cool, let's move to the next tool. I personally work a lot with web, with network, APIs. So I need tools to run different load testings and performance testings. And there are, again, many tools to do that. The two tools I use mostly is K6 from Grafana Labs. It's a CLI tool, it's a bit more scriptable, so quite a nice tool. But for smaller projects, I actually use Vigeta. I hope I pronounced it correctly. And so this tool is really minimalistic, but it's also very powerful. Um, it can easily you know, bring your API down. And so you can create multiple configurations files, or just use from the command line tool. So you can kind of 
uh, tell it what request to make uh, for which duration and then also from these output generate some report right so we can hit something like that and see very simple result right kind of the status codes percentile latencies and total request count and and etc now we engineers always blame dns for different outages right when something breaks it's always dns and we can use this tool called dig to you know see the dns records all right but there's a, a little bit more user-friendly tool nowadays called doggo so it's a i think there was a cool dog, but then it's not maintained anymore. And then dog go is basically written in Go, so dog go. And then we can give it, yeah, uh, let's say a domain name and see the A records by default, right? Or also specify the record type, so maybe kind of A and MX, right? And maybe kind of include different uh, other fields. So time it took, right? So did some measurements. Cool. So maybe now you want to monitor some websites. And see it as a graph, you can use something like gping. And uh, let's do okay, kind of, you know, my personal website, maybe something like here, right? And yeah, basically it's a ping command, but with a graph, right? So kind of cool looking. I was actually learning Zeek language recently, and uh, yeah, also wrote a similar program uh, called Zeek ping to yeah, monitor multiple websites. And uh, yeah, draw it as a graph. The graph is very simplistic and the functionality is limited, but yeah, just uh, as a learning exercise. So now when it comes to a developer workstation, I don't use uh, much tools, right? I don't use multiplexers like Tmux or Zellich. There, maybe there'll be a time I'll use something like that. But uh, for now, kind of splitting panes was, and kind of managing multiple tabs was enough for me. So. I use Ghosty, for example, and, and I can do this and then I can do vertically, right? So I have three panes. I can switch uh, between them quite easily. So, um, yeah, obviously it doesn't save sessions, but that's enough for my um, workload usually. But there are quite a few smaller tools that I use, um, you know, to monitor the resources. So one is BTOP, so it's a uh, better top, I guess. Super nice tool to monitor your resources. Again, filter, so instead of using a built-in top command. Oh, and maybe the last one. Um, really helpful when you want to share your terminal sessions with someone else as a video, not to record, you know, uh, MP4 files and send them over the network. There is this tool called Ask an Emma. You can do, I believe, record and maybe a file, right? Let's do a demo cast. Now, recording is happening. We can, yeah, again, write some commands. So maybe like FD again, uh, maybe run something like, yeah, you can say hello channel, right? And then exit the recording and then we can upload it as well so we can do upload here which will generate this link for us and so it created this video from where you can copy all the text right because it's not a simple video it's the specific format and yeah it respects all the colors of our shell and so forth so quite nice tool some of these cli and ty tools have been written in go and some of them I mean, obviously not all, but some of them have been written in this bubble T library, which is quite great, and I covered it in the previous video, so yeah, uh, go and check it out and maybe build something fun as well. There is a huge amount of command line tools and terminal UI apps, so we can't list them all, though I tried. I tried to mention what I use personally, and also not all of them made into this list. The tools I just shared with you should work in any modern terminal emulator. I use Ghosty, and it works great here. And yeah, that's it for today. I'll share the links to these tools, how to install them, and I hope it was helpful, and see you later. Bye.